getting into your program. <clears throat> just wanted to let you all know. And I mean, I had a real hard time. You can't get in until the meeting gets started. Okay. Okay. So, You'll okay. just get a notice that says that you'll be let in or you're in the waiting you'll be no, let no, in actually, to the waiting room it, it did not say that i mean it had happened to me before when i was in a little early but today what i found was there is just <clears throat> so much stuff on the websites that i think i mean just a suggestion a very clear thing in the beginning where you can click it's very visible and it'll take you or and at the bottom you can say that you know you can it's only this time there are areas where it tells you what time it is uh, starts but it was not a simple thing so anyway you'll find you'll find it in the news if you subscribe to our newsletter yeah. all the links i designed the exactly what you're describing is the newsletter. That is the purpose of the newsletter. And you'll find the links and everything have been well. I spent a lot of time thinking about how you would, the, the problem that you, I, I anticipated the problem you're having. And that is all in our newsletter. Like if you look. I do, I do go. So finally, when I got in, I said, oh, I know I can go to the newsletter and get it's all there. Yeah. So you mean for the general public, it is mainly to go to the old episodes that you'll have already put on uh, YouTube, the past episodes? And no, not what what we, um, and, and I can, I, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time right now showing all the links and how it works, but it is on our, it is on our, um, it is on our, um, um, web page. Um, however, the direct link into the show, this show is not there. You have to actually go up to the menu at the top and go over to Tech for Seniors, open it up, and then you get the link. You and I have talked about this for a long time, and we're I'm a little reluctant to put that link right on the front page of our website, because that means that anybody that goes to that website, it's just too easy to hit that button and get into the meeting. And so that's that's what why I do it that way. Um, that's a good idea. I just, you know. Yeah. That, so the newsletter, are, but the new see the newsletter is focused. It's only sent to people who want to be associated with us. So so that's why all that information. So there is a button in the newsletter that is a direct link into this meeting, right? So right. if you just have the newsletter, you click the link, boom, you'll come right into the meeting. But I just don't want that on the very front page of our website because because it's too fighting the bad guys in and that's yeah it's just too easy for, for someone who's yep. not interested in what we're doing and just wants to be disruptive to click that link and come right into the meeting yeah. good yeah, idea. ron ron one thing about the uh, the tech for senior website and if you go to the tech for senior page the the uh the zoom address is there but it is not a link you have to copy and then paste it into your browser and again, and that's for security purposes. Yeah, we just want to make it a little bit difficult for bots and things like that that are trying to just automatically get in there. Regina has that's her it. hand up. Yeah, I'm uh, having problems with my uh, camera. It's telling me that it's not detecting a camera. And I used it yesterday and it was there. I don't, is there any secret pathway to get to the camera? <laughs> the up arrow next to the camera. And then it shows it's, you what camera is connected, if there is a camera. I can't even get it. I mean, I click on that and it doesn't do anything. Not the camera itself, the little up arrow next to it. Right. And, and it should not, show you a list. there. It doesn't okay. come up. And then it's your Windows settings itself, where you don't have your camera activated. Or it may be a Zoom issue when you came in. We got room. You could go out and come back in and try it. Okay, I'll try that and see what happens. Thank you. Try plugging it in. It's plugged in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, Susan, I'm, I don't have a woman's brain. Susan Cashmore has her hand up. Yes, I just wanted to add to, to my uh, comment earlier when I said I used the space bar on my iPad when I wanted to speak. Um, I, 
I really should have said I used the space bar on my magic keyboard because otherwise you'd be wondering what I was trying to do. So I recently purchased a, a magic keyboard for my iPad and I, I really like it, but I've never used it before for a Zoom meeting. And one would think that the space bar on that keyboard would allow me to unmute, but it didn't, so. Nope, Mac works that, a little that, different. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have found on these Zoom meetings, when you first come in, if you're muted, the uh, space bar will not work. If you unmute yourself and then mute yourself again, from that point on, the space bar will work. Oh, I see. Even on this magic keyboard. I would assume so, yes. Okay, well, I guess I have to try that. Um, hey, not on an iPad even with a keyboard. You're muted now. It was in you. Yep. I tried that and you couldn't hear me. Okay. Okay. Donna, you have a question. Yes, um, Huey, I went ahead and installed Evernote <clears throat> after your seminar yesterday, but I did it on my main computer. And now when I open Chrome, is I open Chrome, Evernote, and it says it's on the web, comes up first. It's, it's very strange. And so the notes I put in, they come up as I turn on Chrome, but it says it's the web. So I, I'm i just surprised. And I have to wait till it comes up before Chrome even gives me a browser. Close your, uh, or, or check your settings in Chrome to what program or how it opens up. You, what you have is it's it's probably set to the last thing that you had open, okay. and and so no, that may be the. It's not. I know it's not that. You well, know, I'm not sure how to diagnose it here in the few minutes okay. that we have. All right, that's all right. I just, I mean, I can I can tolerate it, but it's just very. Yeah, strange. if you have more trouble with it, give me uh, uh, drop me a line this afternoon. Maybe I can touch base with you and take a look at it. All right. I don't have an email for you. Do I just send Huey it to Huey? at Huey.net. Okay, Huey at Huey.net. Okay, thank you. Just to let you know, we have left and we're driving down the road right now on the way to Minnesota. Yeah, I can look out your window and I can see you're moving. <laughs> hey, hey, Huey, or yeah. Huey, this is for you and for all the club members. Do you know anything about Jeff Phillips, Jeffrey? Is uh, I phoned him a couple of times and he doesn't return my phone call. Well, he's he's doing just fine. Talked to him about two weeks ago. He's he's doing just fine. It, he, maybe something is wrong. And he's not getting your messages. But yeah, good. good. Thank All you. Well. Regina, uh, Regina has is her back. Up. Yep, but we still don't see her. No, so I'll just listen today. I won't. Um, Y'all won't see me, so that's a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> not really. Sure it is. <laughs> My daughter told me yesterday I need to go get a haircut, so. It's down around my waist almost now. <laughs> not quite. But Maybe that's why the camera is not turning on. <laughs> you got too much hair in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, check the chat for you. We're going to make it to 100 or 93. The live stream's going, so uh, we're, we've got some people over there watching. But we're, actually, we should. We've got 95. Are we almost going to get to 100? Three minutes left. I'm right there with Regina. What? My got a question. This long in 30 years. Detlef has a question. Yeah, Huey, it's for you. I started watching your presentation yesterday and then I had to leave early. Um, is it on your website, the rest of it? Uh, it's not on the website. I do have it on uh, my channel on YouTube and I will drop, uh, actually from yesterday, there's three recordings. 
and uh, or you can go to my website and look at my uh, blog, and I do have it there. But I'll I'll drop it in the uh, in the chat box. That would be terrific. Thanks. <clears throat> Yep, I think we're going to make it <clears throat> three more coming in, and that'll put us up to 97. <clears throat> Getting close. So we'll be starting the meeting right at, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be starting the meeting right at nine o'clock. Hey, Bob? Yep. Okay. I have a suggestion. Uh, I've been having trying to use Google Docs and um, Google Drive, and I'm have been having trouble trying to organize the files on it. So I was thinking maybe if you any of you use that, particularly that uh, might give us a few minutes on how to organize stuff under Google Docs or Google Drive, so uh, we can find things easier. That might be a good um, good topic for us to discuss. Thanks, Jim. We'll we'll put that on the put that on the list. Thank you. And and what well, we'll talk about. Everyone knows we have a question and answer afterwards, so that's uh, that's fine. Well, for the new people that are here, we have a question and answer session yeah. after the meeting. <laughs> And it is it is now nine o'clock, so we will. Uh, oh. We're at ninety seven people, and we've got some over on our streaming service going. So we will start the meeting. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm going to mute all, and we will do that. And we will share my screen. Uh, we'll share it here, and we'll share it with sound, and we will see if we can play this. Tech for Senior, episode 55. It is April the 12th, 2021, and I want to welcome everybody here. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, we have uh, 99 people watching us and a whole bunch of people over on the streaming service. So uh, as I've mentioned many times in the past, um, it's a volunteer organization, and what we uh, get out of it is your enthusiasm and for your support, we continue on to do the shows and, and to continue with the programming. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as you know, we are streaming this to two services. One is through our Zoom meeting, which you, uh, you uh, the 99 of you, or 100, 100 of you are now uh, participating in, and there's a bunch over on our um, YouTube service. <clears throat> so um, the meetings are a little bit Excuse me. Just <clears throat> the meetings. The meetings are a little bit different. Our Zoom meeting today um, is an action-packed one. We have lots of things to talk about and lots of things to do, uh, and it will go on for an hour. And then the last twenty minutes uh, will be uh, question and answer. Uh, over on our Zoom side, for those of you who are watching on the streaming service to Zoom, uh, we will be. Uh, it, the show will end. Um, uh, in, in about, it will end in about 50, 50 minutes. And we will, um, and that will, um, but they will all be recorded. The show is recorded for your uh, pleasure so that you can watch uh, by the end of the day. You uh, said on Zoom, but you meant YouTube. Yes, YouTube. Yes, it's being streamed over on YouTube and uh, it's, uh, it will be finished at uh, 50, uh, in about 50 minutes, just before the music segment. Um, 
just to clarify, um, last week we had a bit of confusion. Well, at least I had a little bit of confusion. Um, I wanted to stream it to uh, both services, YouTube and uh, Facebook. And we, uh, because we do that uh, on our Thursday morning show that we do uh, called Tech for Senior Live, where Huey and Bob and I get together and just have us a bit of a chat. But we use a product called uh, StreamYard, which makes it very easy to stream to different services. So I assumed on the button at the bottom here, uh, when I clicked on it, um, it, it has an option for Facebook and YouTube. So the problem is it's one or the other, not both. Uh, you, uh, to, to stream to both services would require additional software in the form of purchasing Restream, which is a third party software. And that's just sort of, we're in the sort of thoughts about that and how it's all gonna work and so on and so forth. So more, more of that to come uh, a, little bit, a little bit later. I want to welcome everyone here uh, and certainly my, uh, all the people on the show today. Huey, where are you? There you are. Hi, uh, Huey. Um, we have a busy week. What are we doing on Thursday? Well, we're doing a couple of things. The first thing we're doing is uh, just going to chat in our Tech for Senior Live. Right. Then we're going to take a little potty break and then we're going to come back and do learning Chromebooks. Yeah, we had a busy day, eh? Now, how would one register for learning Chromebooks if uh, if they haven't already done so? They've got to go to a link that they can find in, a, in the newsletter or on our website uh -huh. or on my website and go to that link and they register and they will be sent a link to the meeting uh, that's just for them. Right, right. And that would be, and if they have registered, you're going to be sending out a they, reminder today? Yeah, I'm going to send out a reminder after our meeting, and then I'll send another one uh, come Thursday. Excellent. So we hope to see everybody, uh, either if you have a Chromebook or think about a Chromebook, come and, come and listen to our talk. And for sure, if you want to have coffee, uh, we will have coffee with you on Thursday morning. Bob, tell us who won the Masters. Hideki. Excellent golfer. Yeah. Hideki. Uh, Yatsumama. Yeah, I think I'm close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. It was, it was great. Yeah. Um, and you've been busy uh, buying up stuff on Amazon this week. Not a whole lot, but I got a nice new toy I'm waiting for, and something that should be able to hook up to the camera on my phone. Something that's going to bring the mountain that's behind me a lot closer. I want to do some exploring and get some pictures up close. We'll see once it gets here, because it has a, a, a hookup directly to the camera on the phone. Great, great. Well, I'm sure we'll hear all about it. I'm sure that you'll hear all about it. Ray, um, now tell me, have you got your seatbelt on with that new computer? No, it's not that fast, but it's fast enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. I'm, uh, I am I didn't want to do a clone copy of my old computer because I was having some issues with it and didn't want to bring them onto the new one. So I'm, I'm reloading it every day. I think, well, I'm finally done with getting every program I need. And I try to open up something and nope, one more to go. So this, uh, hopefully by the next week, I'll be all done. There you go. And Dewey is on the road, as we shall say. He's on the move. He's in the car. Joanne is at the wheel. And man, he's a dedicated person. He says, I can't miss my tech for seniors. So he is, he's on the road. And here is Dewey. What do you got to say? Can you hear us? Well, well I am riding in the car right now. My wife, Joanne, my sweetie is driving down a toll, down a toll road for a while. Get, when we get on Interstate 25 here, we're in Denver, Colorado, or North Denver, actually. Uh, we are at our son's house in Superior, uh, Colorado, which is uh, kind of southwest, I believe, of Boulder. We were in Boulder last night. As a matter of fact, we went to a special restaurant in Boulder called The Kitchen, and it's owned by Kimball Musk, who is the younger brother of Elon Musk. And Elon comes and visits his brother and has dinner at this restaurant periodically. But it was quite a quite an evening needless to say well anyway uh hope you have a great tech for seniors and i'll be in the car watching and staying in touch <laughs> bye-bye now okay. say hello to joanne will do okay thanks a lot all right so listen uh, the um the big news this week uh, came on uh, uh oh huey 
If you wanted to keep up to date on all the news and and have it in one specific location, and where would you find that? Well, you're going to put me on the spot, huh? <laughs> would it be our Facebook page? Yeah, it would definitely be our Facebook page. It would be our where, Facebook. That's because you're posting there, I'm posting there, Bob's posting there, that's and right. we're putting lots of lots of good links of and good information. So yeah, if yeah. if you're on Facebook, that's a nice place to go visit. Now, the, uh, the big news of the day was, uh, was that um, uh, Microsoft bought uh, Nuance, which is uh, a, a company that makes Dragon Natural Speaking, for $16, uh, $16 billion. Not million, billion, billion dollars. Now, why that's significant is, is uh, well, Dewey, Dewey and I uh, go back a long way and we talk, like to talk about this, but I wanted to let you know that Dragon Naturally Speaking was developed in the 80s by a person by the name of uh, Baker. Uh, let's see, James Baker. And I actually met I met him uh, because back in the 80s was when I became partner in a software company that made medical software. And my job was to teach uh, doctors how to use Dragon Naturally Speaking. This is way before, just when PCs came in. And I went to Dragon School in... Uh, in um, went to Dragon School in, uh, in California and learned all about the speech recognition and so on and so forth. And then my job was to, uh, was to teach. Uh, now, um, about, I think it was about the year 2000 was um, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they um, Baker, I don't know why they wanted to sell. It wasn't, the, the business was getting bigger and they couldn't really manage it. And they sold it to a Belgian company called uh, Lerner and Hosp, and this, um, this uh, and they, I don't what, remember what they paid, but, the, but Baker took the, uh, the, the, they took it in stock. They took the, the sale of this company, which was, of course, an upstand, a, a very upstarting company. Uh, they took the sale in stock, and it ended up being all fraud. It was the whole thing was all fraud, and they basically lost, lost all, everything. And there wasn't, um, and 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 it was the company was in shambles, and the and the court, uh, the courts were um, arguing over this, and nobody wanted to buy this this little company, right? And <clears throat> I said to um, my board of directors on the because it was not out of reach of our company, I said we should buy this. I mean, it was going for like five cents on the dollar, but nobody wanted it. Well, um, another company bought it called Scansoft and ultimately kept it for many years and of course promoted it and it became Nuance. Nuance merged with Scansoft and uh, today it just sold for 16 <clears throat> billion dollars. So <clears throat> this morning as I was brushing my teeth and thinking about life I thought you know I wonder if we bought the company if where we'd be today. Anyway <laughs> that's the, that was my thought. Anyway listen I've blabbed on enough. Uh, Bob are you ready to roll? As soon as you stop talking, I'll be happy to start doing it. <laughs> Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending April 9th, 2021. Cyber attack targets EU institutions. According to Bloomberg, a spokesperson for the European Commission confirmed that a number of European Union organizations experienced an IT security incident in their IT infrastructure last week, adding that no major information breach had been detected yet. The spokesperson would not supply further details on the attack as the investigation is still in its initial stage. An inside source told Blumberg that the attacks were bigger than average and serious enough to warrant an alert issued to all Commission senior officials. Another anonymous source said the Commission staff had recently been warned about potential phishing attempts, which suggests the attack may have been expected. Government institutions have to face way more risks than the average user, commented a vast security evangelist Louis Carones. On top of the day-to-day -day attacks, they hold valuable information that is a target to cybercriminal groups 
and foreign intelligence agencies. Android malware promising free Netflix did not provide free Netflix. Surprise, surprise. You never know what you'll find on the Google Play Store. But if you see an app promising free Netflix, please ignore it and borrow a family member's account like the rest of us. An app called Flix Online sat on the Play Store for two months promising free Netflix. And naturally, it managed to dump malware on around 500 devices. Yes, we all deserve free Netflix for reason of quarantine, but you're not going to find free Netflix on the App Store or anywhere outside of genuine Netflix trial, for that matter. This was discovered by Checkpoint and reported it to Google. Google has taken down the app. While this Flix Online malware may seem like a simple worm, it could also be used to pull personal data from victims' phones or hijack other apps. If you downloaded Flix Online, you should delete the app and change the password for all accounts that you access on your phone. Maybe now's a good time to generate secure login info with a password manager and lock down your account with two-factor authentication. Google begins trials of new ad targeting tech. This week, Google began testing its new ad targeting tech known as the Federated Learning of Cohorts, Flock. This is a random selection of Google Chrome users. The new tech is intended to replace cookies, assigning each user a Flock ID number instead which informs advertisers of the user's behavioral patterns over the previous week, including the websites that were visited. The Chrome users participating in the trial do not know they are participating, and the only way to opt out is to turn off third-party cookies in the browser's settings. Watchdog Group Electronic Frontier Foundation strongly criticizes the new tech. Read more on the EFF website. Malware hidden in Call of Duty cheat. Activision published a report this week warning users that hackers have been disguising malware as a cheat for Call of Duty Warzone. The game is free to play and hosts millions of users. The malware installs a dropper on the user's system, which is then poised to receive more malware from its command and control center. The anonymous source told Vice that one of the malware's goals is to hijack the user's computer power and use it to mine cryptocurrency. The hackers selling the malware even posted a tutorial video on YouTube to teach attackers how to use it. In the last year, Activision has banned over 80,000 cheaters from Call of Duty Warzone. Arguments for and against regulating Google. Tech giant Google is embroiled in three antitrust lawsuits, including one brought by the U.S. Department of Justice, which alleges the company acts like a monopoly and elbows out competition. The Land of the Giants podcast recently devoted an episode to discussing the pros and cons of breaking up Google. According to Vox, supporters of regulating Google believe that the Internet titan has amassed too much influence over daily life and the economy, and that people are essentially forced to use its products. Those against any new regulations claim that because Google's products are largely free, they are beneficial to consumers and tighter restrictions could stymie some of Google's greatest innovations. The Facebook data leak and what you should do about it today. Over the holiday weekend, we learned that over half a billion Facebook users' personal data, including phone numbers, was leaked online. Facebook themselves confirmed the leak, saying that it was a result of a vulnerability they fixed back in 2019. While the vulnerability and the theft may seem old news because it was nearly two years ago, 
The development means Facebook users whose data was stolen in 2019 are at greater risk now because of the leak and should take steps today to better protect themselves from it. The reports indicate the data includes phone numbers, Facebook ID, full names, locations, birthdays, biographical information, and some email addresses for users from around the world. The loss of phone numbers associated with the email is particularly worrisome. The odds are good that for many people, their phone number and email combinations are the same for that of SMS-based codes to log in to those same email accounts. This means those users are at increased risk for attackers to try SIM swapping, to redirect SMS-based codes to devices under their control and get access to the target's email. Because email accounts are where I forgot my password resets go, this is the easiest, most efficient, and effective way for attackers to take over your digital life by first hijacking your email account and then using that to take over your other accounts. And that wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Well, th <clears throat> thanks, Bob. That uh, looks like the bad guys are still on track. Of course. All right. Let's move on and see what Dewey has to say. We will come over here and let's see what Dewey has to say. Can I mention something just before you pop the click there? Sure. Um, about the sale of Nuance Corporation to uh, Microsoft. And it's Nuance that provides the technology that uh, Apple uses with its Siri voice to text uh, operation. So I just thought I'd bring that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Good morning, friends. This is Dewey. And I'm coming to you today from our son's house in Superior, Colorado, which is the northern Denver suburb. It's directly southeast of Boulder, which is in the valley behind my head. Uh, anyway, uh, some of those of you familiar with this area might recognize at the extreme upper right of my background, uh, a mountain peak called Long's Peak. Well, my Tech Talk topic for today is ATSC 3.0 also known as Next Gen TV. So what is ATC 3.0, ATSC 3.0? ATSC stands for the Advanced Television Systems Committee, an industry-sponsored group that sets standards for over-the-air broadcast TV as approved by the US FCC. ASTC 3.0 represents a major leak, leap over the current a 1.0 standard for antenna users. From this point on, I'll simply call these two standards 3.0 and 1.0. In January 2020, ATSC welcomed the news that the ITU, International Telecommunications Union, has adopted 3.0 as a recommended digital broadcast standard for the world, in effect, paving the way for countries around the world to evaluate and use the IP-based digital broadcast standard. 3.0 greatly expands flexibility and adaptability for broadcasters, allowing them to transmit data that will both enhance TV broadcasts and provide new revenue opportunities. For your information, 1.0 is the designation used retroactively to describe the first digital standard developed by the ATSC around 1996 or 92, I believe, which ushered in the revolution of the HDTV high-definition television and broadcasts around sound that we enjoy today. In Canada, broadcasters are not mandated by the CRTC, which is the Canadian Radio and Television Commission, to deliver 3.0. The same is true in the U.S. However, the FCC has partially subsidized and incentivized the adoption of 3.0. So it will be going forward in the US. And what is next gen TV? 
Next Gen TV is the ATSC's name used to promote the 3.0 standard worldwide. Next Gen's logo is shown at the right. 3.0 Next Gen TV's standards include Ultra HD 4K video, HDR, you know, high dynamic range, high frame rates up to 120 hertz and more. Proponents also claim better TV reception indoors and if the cellular industry approves, on your phone as well. Next Gen TV also provides consistent volume across channels while voice plus dialogue enhancement allows one to hear all the voices clearly. It uses the same standard TV antennas available TV today and Next Gen TV is free. Good news. Next Gen TV is incompatible, that's bad news, with tuners and present day TV sets. Fortunately, three major TV manufacturers, LG, Samsung, and Sony, have been offering TVs that include a 3.0 standard tuner since 2020 and are expanding their offerings through 2021 and beyond. Most, if not all, new TVs in the future will have tuners that accommodate both the newer 3.0 and the present TV 1.0 standards for at least five years. As next-gen TV becomes more and more popular here and worldwide, other TV manufacturers are expected to join LG, Samsung, and Sony in offering compatible TVs. Another option for receiving next-gen TV with your present TV is to purchase an external 3.0 tuner. These currently cost around $200, but prices are expected to drop to a fraction of that as 3.0 TVs proliferate. According to ATSC.org, which you can go to and get a lot of very current information, viewers in South Korea have been enjoying 4K video and immersive audio via 3.0 since 2017. The U.S. rollout, for the most part, began early last year. With a focus on the top 10 Nielsen markets, next-gen TV is expected to increase implementation in more than 80 U.S. cities by the end of 2021 and will cover more than 70% of the U.S. population. That's pretty big. Here's a U.S. map showing the fledgling status of next-gen TV through this year. This map, if you look at it, first notice the orange areas. Orange are the areas that are now on the air with Next Gen TV or ATSC 3.0. Uh, the the uh, blue areas are re readying broadcasts at this time and hopefully will be on the air by the end of the year. And the the black areas are, have been announced as have been announced as target markets, and some of them will make it this year or perhaps next year. Many next-gen TV features have not yet been implemented, but it's still quite early. Timeline-wise, we're perhaps 15 to 20 years behind if we use the HDTV rollout for comparison. That started back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Those early days of HGTV were rocky at best and weren't seen by many people, thankfully. Also similar to those early HGTV broadcast days, there's very little current or very little content at Ultra HD 4K video resolution at this time. There's a potential downside to internet-based next-gen TV because TV broadcasters can track your viewing habits to gain information uh, for targeted advertising, just like companies such as Google, Facebook, and Amazon do today. I'll be telling you more about that in part two of this presentation. Meanwhile, here's some other general information on HD TV. If you presently receive your TV from streaming, cable, or satellite, Next Gen TV will affect you very little, if at all, perhaps mainly in TV subchannels. Transition to 3.0 standards by TV broadcast stations is voluntary, though many stations, as shown earlier on the US map, are already in process. Stations adding Next Gen TV are required to continue broadcasting the older 1.0 TV for five years. How will Next Gen TV work in your home? 
The simplest description is an antenna connected to, uh, to your TV gets you better free TV, but that's selling next-gen TV way short. Since next-gen TV is primarily internet protocol based you know, on the internet, it can be used just like to today's smartphones, tablets, and computers and, interconnect and internet connected TVs. One example of how this might work is having your TV antenna connected to a tuner box and not connected directly to your TV. That makes it more expandable to other devices. Unlike the switch over to digital broadcast TV a dozen years ago, the FCC has not granted over-the-air TV broadcasters new bandwidth during the 3.0 rollout. You know, they had to have that so they could uh, have both systems simultaneously for a while. Consequently, broadcasters will need to temporarily share transmitters. Two or more stations will combine to use one tower for 1.0 broadcasts and also combine to use another tower for the 3.0 next-gen broadcasts. Quality may suffer a bit, however, but it will be temporary. One of next-gen TV's more controversial features is a return data path, a way for the station you're watching to know you're watching. This creates the opportunity for every marketer's dream targeted ads. Ah, yes targeted ads. I'll be telling you more about that <clears throat> and other next-gen TV stuff in part two of this presentation next week. In the meantime, stay safe, have a great day, and uh, we'll see you next week. And I'm sticking with it. Well, well done. Um... Well done. Um... Dewey has uh, presented that from uh, uh, have, from the car. There you go. All right, uh, I'm going to uh, start my segment now, and we will uh, we'll talk about this is uh, the first of three parts on virtual reality, and we will um, we'll uh, we'll look at that now. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. Today's topic is virtual reality for seniors. Now you know the routine. If you like this video, please click the like and also subscribe to the channel. It really helps our channel and people wanting to watch this video. Let's get on with the show. Now this presentation is going to be in three parts. The first part will be the history of virtual reality. Part two is what can you buy in 2021? the hardware. We'll look at the hardware associated with virtual reality. Part three will be, what should seniors use virtual reality for? Now let's look at the history of virtual reality. Where did it all start? What can we define as virtual reality? And let's look at Holland in 1881. The man's name was Hendrik Willem Mesdag. But if we were not so strict and we could argue that virtual reality goes back to the 19th century, let's look what could have happened in 1881. This was the year that the panorama Mesdag was finished. Now this is a very large painting. It's a cylindrical panorama painting of approximately 14 meters high and set up with a circumference around 120 meters. The painting is one of the oldest 19th century panoramas in the world. It is a view of the North Sea, the dunes, the Hague, and as Scheveningen. Excuse my Dutch. Now, as Rembrandt is associated with Amsterdam and Vermeer is with Delft, so Mesdag is associated with the Hague. Mesdag was born in Holland in 1831 and later moved to The Hague with his wife. He was considered an influential man in the art world of The Hague. And he was an important painter and a member on a lot of arts council. The contract for painting this panorama came from Belgium, where such paintings were a huge trend. Mesdag didn't actually paint this all by himself. He painted this with his wife, he painted it with students and other people who helped him paint this very large painting. 
And this could arguably be the first virtual reality painting that we have. And if you go to The Hague today, there's a large museum. And you'll see in this picture people coming up in the center of the museum and looking at 360 degree view right around. Pretty impressive. You could always argue that in 1939 this also could have been the first virtual reality. This was invented in 1839. This 3D illusion was achieved by lining up two mirrors to reflect two images. As photography had not yet progressed to have images, so they appeared as drawings. And so this is how you had a 3D image in 1839. Now in 1939, Sawyer Incorporated was one of the largest color postcard producers of the time. And it streamlined the device even more by taking color images, and we had Kodachrome film then, and making it available by placing them between two discs. In other words, 14 images for seven stereo views. And then you inserted this disc into a special viewer and eventually became known as a Viewmaster later on. And this was a device that was a big hit in 1939 at the World's Fair. And as Sawyer Incorporated was a postcard company, the first reels were a series of travel-related images of the Grand Canyon and Carlsbad Caverns. Now Sawyer Incorporated acquired True Vision, a competing stereo manufacturer and the process, the rights to use Walt Disney Studio characters in their reels was obtained. A year later in 1952, a home use camera was even sold so families could make their own reels. Several models of the Viewmaster were developed, including a model known for illumination. In 1962, saw the arrival of the modern Viewmaster. Model E was streamlined and now made of lighter plastic, and we have a picture of it here. I'm sure we all had one of those when we were way back when. Now in 1962, the first immersive experience happened. Fast forward when the machine was introduced, known as one of the earliest examples of immersive multi-sensor technologies. This way the machine was capable of triggering all the senses in an effective manner. And the experience is a, was about riding on a motorcycle through the New York streets while feeling the wind blowing through your hair, hearing the sounds of the city, and inhaling the smells of the city. And here you have a picture of the Sensorama in 1962 one of the first virtual reality machines that we had. A few years later, it was 1968. The most people argue as the year the first head-mounted display was developed. This head-mounted display was entitled Head Sight and was made for helicopter pilots in the military. Head movements would move a remote camera, allowing the user to naturally look around in the camera. And here's an example of that. But the head site was not actually developed for virtual reality applications. It was mostly a military application. And it wasn't until 1987 when a man by the name of John Lanier used the term virtual reality for the first time when he developed VR gear, virtual reality gear. Now, during the 1990s to the 2000s, there was certainly a decrease in popularity of virtual reality. During the 1990s, Jaron Lanier, but also Tom Zimmerman, marketed a range of virtual reality gear. However, the hype around the technology had an adverse effect and led to a decrease in popularity. Don't know if anybody remembered some of the, the early machines we had, and this is one that never really had much popularity. This was called Virtual Boy, and it came out by Nintendo. 
Now, between the year 2000 and 2010, not much worth mentioning happened when it comes to head-mounted displays. However, some technologies related to virtual reality, such as Google Street View, that eventually was supported 3D, were developed in this period. Now, really between 2010 and 2015, virtual reality was reborn. In 2010, things started to get moving again. A man by the name of Palmer Lucky designed the first prototype of the Oculus Rift in his garage. Remember Bill Gates? Remember that story? And in 2012, they presented the first example of the Oculus Rift for the E3 gaming trade show. Well, in 2013 and 2014, Oculus shipped their first and second development kits ordered through their Kickstarter project. But it wasn't until 2014 Oculus was purchased by Facebook. Sony also announced a VR headset that was later going to become the PlayStation. Paul Murlocky didn't win the lottery, but he did suddenly find himself with a life-changing amount of money when he sold his startup to Facebook for over $2 billion when he was just 21 years old. Lucky is the co founder of Oculus, the virtual reality technology company that makes the Rift VR headset. Between 2015 and 2020, we saw a rise in virtual reality. In 2015, HTC combined with a company called Valve and announced the HTC Vive headset with controllers and base station to allow for positional tracking using infrared light. In 2016, HTC was ready to ship its first unit called the HTC Vive Stream VR headset. This was the first commercial release of a sensor-based tracking which allowed for free movement of the users within a predefined space in their own living room. In 2017, Sony filed a patent that indicated they were developing a similar location tracking technology as the Vive for, they, for their PlayStation virtual reality. It also showed potential for the development of a wireless VR headset. And of course, in 2018, Oculus launched their first commercially available VR headset, which was, has a built-in screen that was affordable. There are many companies making virtual reality products, but if you go to Best Buy, you really have one of three choices. You'll have a choice of the Vive HTC, the Quest 2, the Oculus Quest 2, or the PlayStation VR. Well, there's, there's, there is one more. This is made by Microsoft. This is the HoloLens 2. It's not found at Best Buy. In fact, you can only buy it from Microsoft. And that's because it's $3,500. Yikes! Anyway, we'll be talking a little bit about that in one of our later videos. HoloLens is the most comfortable mixed reality device with industry-leading solutions that deliver an immersive experience, all enhanced by reality, security, and scalability of cloud and AI services from Microsoft. We'll be hearing a lot more about the HoloLens 2 this year. Well, as they say, stay tuned for part two. It, it's Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. All righty. Huey, are you ready? Of course. The paste formatted text is plain text in Windows 10. I'm Huey Poplock. I may not be the typical person, but I find myself often wanting to copy text from an article or a website and put it in a document and have my own formatting, not their formatting, because it may not be the fonts I want. It may have bolding. It may have paragraph markings. It may be intermixed with some graphics 
there may be a lot of reasons I want to change the formatting. I found an article this past week and I started to look at it and I was going to use it as the basis of this presentation, but I found that a lot of things didn't work the way they explained it. Let's take a look at the article. How to paste as plain text in Windows 10. And here's an area. Let's just take this, how to paste, and we're going to copy this. When we copy it, if we paste it now into a Word document, let's paste it with Control V, and I do it, and here's what it looks like in my document. That's not how I want it to be. Judging by the article, one of the ways in which we can do that is using the control shift V. We've already copied it. So when we bring our document over and we do a control shift V, nothing, absolutely nothing. It doesn't work. According to the article, this is their number one way of doing this. What are our alternatives? What can we do? Well, uh, so I jumped down to the second item, and it said using the paste special key. And when I do that, that's not there either. Windows has changed in the way they do things. So we've got a couple of choices here that we're going to have to change a little bit. The third is by using Notepad, and I use, I use this trick a lot. And let's go ahead and let me show you what I mean. We're going to open up a Notepad. And Notepad, if you're not familiar with it, is just that. It's a Notepad. It's a non-formatting text editor. So if I paste into this, it's exactly what I want. Text that's not formatted. Then I can copy it again. And now I'm going to bring my Word document over. I'm going to paste it into my Word document, Control V, and you can see that it's unformatted. Now I can say, okay, let's do this. Let's make this a heading. Uh, let's go ahead and make this uh, a different font. Let's, oh, I like that one. I don't, but I, I'll, I'll use it anyway. And let's say we're going to make it uh, 26. And so we've got that, and then we can make this italic. And then we're going to go ahead and bullet point, not number it like it was. And then we have a bullet. So we've done our own formatting. That's why you might want to do something like this. So that's one way, using Notepad as an intermediary. Copy and paste into Notepad. Copy and paste from Notepad to whatever, whether it be a Word document, your email program, Gmail, uh, Outlook, whatever. So... Number three works. Number four probably works, but I don't use the clipboard. I use, I use a program called Clipmate, which keeps track of all of these things. So let's go ahead and I'm going to bring Clipmate over to show you what I see with Clipmate. And there's a long list. It, it maintains a whole list of all of the clips that I've done, all of the copying that I've done. You'll notice this mark right here. It says remove line breaks between paragraphs, press control to remove all the line breaks, breaks and so on. So what I can do is when we go to Word, let's take the original document and we're going to take again this area right here. And then when we bring over our Word document, Clipmate program, the program that I use called Clipmate, and I have done a recording of how to use and what Clipmate is, and I'll put that in the notes. But if I click, all I do is click that one button, and I don't know if you noticed down here, it changed it from the fact that there were some links and so on to a little notepad. Now when I go and I just click Control V, it's, it's already stripped out. Not only is it stripped out all of the format, it's even stripped out the paragraph marks and so on. Now there's some other ways. Now remember it said here that we should be able to, let me move this out. And said, so, remember I said, through the keyboard shortcut and it doesn't work. Well, there's some ways around that. It is long and tedious, but you can do it. In Word, 
what we have to do is go to File, go to Options down at the bottom, then go to Advanced, then down here where it says Cut, Copy, and Paste, you'll see some areas here. One is pasting from other programs. That's what we're going to do. That's what we want to hit. So we want to keep text only. We click that and click OK. We can save this. Now, if we copy this and then go to our document, we should see, we do a control Z, it's doing it that way because we're doing it from another document. The problem with this is, what if I want to use the format in another document? I've got to go back and undo what I just did as a setting in Word. So let's see what else we can do. We can also try a third party program that was recommended in the article that I was using. I am not familiar with the program, but if we click on this and go to pure text, there is a free program which will allow us to install the program and then be able to set up a set of keystrokes to ta take care of whenever we want to do this. We do a control V and paste. We've got our document that we're reproducing. You'll notice down here there is a control key. There's paste options. When you click on that, you've got several things that you can do. The first one being keep your source formatting, which is what we're seeing here. The next one would be merge formatting, and it'll look like this. Or you can do this, which is use destination styles. So whatever your formatting is in the document you're pasting it to, would it would pick that up. Or keep text only, and you can click there. That's probably the quickest and easiest thing to do. So don't forget this little box that pops up every time you paste something. Look at the paste options. And then set your default paste so you can set a default and then always change it to something else. Happy pasting. I'm Huey Poplock. And I did want to say that uh, Bob uh, G. reminded me there is another way uh, when you're copying something, if you right mouse click, the uh, options, that same uh, little box is in your options uh, with within a long list. And I didn't have that in the art within my uh, presentation. Thanks, Huey. Uh, Bob, did you have something for us? I want to share a little battery saving tip if you have a newer smartphone and it has 5G set as its main way of connecting, but you happen to live in an area where 5G isn't available, you're wasting lots of battery power. 5G means it's constantly scanning to find that 5G network that just doesn't exist. I happen to be on a Pixel 5, and the easiest way to get to your settings is to scroll from the top down, and then scroll again, press on the little star on the toward the bottom, that's your settings. Once you get to your settings, go to Network and Internet. Next, check on Mobile Network, and then scroll down until you see Preferred Network type. As you see here on mine, it says 5G recommended. Select preferred network type to bring up the following menu. But I don't have 5G. I have no clue when I'll get 5G. But if 5G is selected, and that's selected by default, it's constantly searching for a 5G network that is nowhere to be found. LTE is what I have and LTE is what I'll now change it to. And once that's done, if you look here, your preferred network type is now LTE. No more looking for 5G that doesn't exist. Stay safe, be free, I hope this helps.
Thanks, Bob. That's great. Uh, Ray, uh, I'm just going to be signing off on the uh, YouTube live stream and maybe you'll be up next. Okay. Okay. Thanks everyone uh, who are on our streaming service. Uh, we're going to be ending the broadcast for you today. Uh, we will see you again next week, same time, same place, same everything. Uh, and you can come in uh, or listen to us on Thursday morning for our little coffee talk. Anyway, um, stay safe and we'll see